episode number. I must say, man, man's got freezer. This is the fourth one. Let's do that again. Speak about it. It's the very last episode of Speak About It. Um, big thank you to Mixtape Madness for allowing me to kind of host this on their channel. Big, big thank you to all my special guests, Gen Z, Ella, Nathan, Hector, and we're going to get into our last one today. Someone who inspires me greatly, someone who um, is in the same field as me, someone who I believe has really opened a lot of doors, someone who I believe in meeting him kind of encapsulates what this whole thing is about it's about kind of reaching out to people who inspire you and gaining as much as you can from their journey and their stories and taking almost their blueprint and, and adding it to your own and creating your own sort of brand without further ado we are going to be getting into a conversation between myself and, and george the poet straight up straight up g tell us a bit about yourself Mm -hmm. What you do, who you are. Anyone don't know, I'm George the Poet. I've been doing performance poetry for about seven years. Started off when I was in uni. It started to build from there. A lot of people didn't know that I was an MC, like straight grime. <laughs> for the majority of my creative life before that. So from about 15 to 19. So when I left uni, I got signed and I started making music. And I, before I dropped my music, everyone was like, ah, I ain't gonna watch. Everyone was really, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I returned back to the musical roots I started with and fortunately been able to build up a music career and a presence in different aspects of public life. Okay, so you're called George the Poet, but your in terms of like your direction is more musical based, but obviously stemming from the poetry. How would you describe kind of your sound? Do you know what I mean? Because um, mm. I, I, I started listening to you as George the Poet, performance poet. Do you know what I mean? And then obviously I could tell that your influences were rap, grime, just because of how you flowed. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and that's similar to kind of mine as well, and kind of how I write and how I come at things as well. Mm. But um, listening to you over the past few years, I've been seeing how you've been fusing things, fusing both poetry and music, and kind of having this unique sound that almost sounds poetic, but it's rappy as well. Like, how would you describe it? I'm trying to describe it for that's you. A good, that's a good question because I think fusion's a big ingredient in what I do. Mm. I can't say that I've always stuck to one musical sound. Sometimes it's been at times it's been garage. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's been dance or mm. do you get me? And people might think, w w how how are you making poetry happen in those spaces? <laughs> yeah. But absolutely. to me it's all about storytelling. Like the reason why we're here, everything that you're doing, Iman. Mm. It's it's also about um representing our people. And we've got all of these different musical forms that take on different tempos, mm. different, they, they create different energies. R there's a certain energy to R&B. Yeah, my, first, my first EP was basically R&B, mm. R&B poetry. Yeah, yeah. Now that, now that I think back to it. So um, I would say fusion is a big component and stories, I'm, I'm a story head. Yeah. Like I've, I've tried, like I've always done different kinds of, but like when we were younger, obviously everyone had freestyles. Mm. But I always lean towards telling stories, whether it was a freestyle tune mm. or concept tune. There was a message behind. There was always a story that I was trying to get leave a message. Mm. So I think those are the two main components of what I do. Okay, sick, sick. So like you touched on kind of um, coming off of uni, you got signed. And um, there's a, probably a lot of people in uni now. When I was at uni, mm. I was kind of, that's when I decided I wanted to do this thing properly. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So how did how did that come about? How did that feel coming off of uni? Like, do you know what I mean? What was that experience like? Yeah. So a lot of people that are in uni now, they say to me, I've got a passion, but I don't know how to make it happen with my studies. Mm. And the thing that I told them is, if you want it, you're going to go get it. Like yeah. anything else. Word. Like no one has to motivate you to go move to move to girls. Do you get me? Like no, <laughs> yeah, no one has to motivate you to get money. Well, no one should have to motivate you to yeah. get money. We do what we want to do in it. Mm. So for me, it was that I was, I was asserting myself, but in some cases I was over over exerting myself. Like, mm. like when I showed up for my final exams in uni, people looked at me like, "Right, I didn't know you were gonna do the exams. I didn't mm. know you were still on the course." Yeah, because well. I was a ghost mm. from second year. It was pretty much I would do all my study independently. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. So because of that, it was um, it was a strain. By the time I graduated, it was. 
I was burnt out. Everyone says you mean was the best time of my life. You definitely like, was not the best. <laughs> definitely was not the best time of my life. Mm. I was I was exhausted by the end of it. But I was glad to be walking into opportunities. I just knew mm. knew that I fought tooth and nail for those opportunities. So none of it as as grateful as I have been mm. and continue to be. Mm. I'm never um I'm never like resting on my laurels or I'm never like it's I'm, what you see is not random. Mm. It's not like I was just fiddling about on my laptop and then one day certain people started phoning me for jobs now. Mm. Every single day because I've been grinding, mm. grinding, grinding for this. So it's, it's not easy. Yeah, man. I mean, even listening to you now, if I'm being real, like, I see a lot of parallels and a lot of similarities kind of how, what my, my, my mindset is and how I come at things as well. But yeah. um, like, if I look back to where I actually met you for the first time, you came to my uni to perform at a show. Yeah. And I remember my brethren actually sent me your Insta post that day. Yeah. And it was something like... Um, Something like I came up doing university shows, it would be yeah. good to go and see what, yeah. what's popping at these unis now. Straight and my bridging sent it to me, and I was like, Oh, yeah, cool. And funny enough, that same day, the guy that was organizing the show, he, um, that's fine, let me take it back. Two weeks beforehand, mm. my, my booking agent, Kimon, um, she just randomly hit me up. She was like, Oh, um, I heard, I heard G's been, been talking about you. Mm. Thinking her, bearing in mind that I have no connection with you, I, I didn't at the that time, point. innit? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I heard she's been talking about you, as I said, and I, I thought she was joking, innit? Because she's from North Easy, do you know what I mean? She's from them sides, and she, I think she's got a close friend that's friends with you as well. Okay. So I think that's how that, 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 that information kind of leaked down and, and, and whatnot. So I thought she was joking, as I said. So on the day, the guy that's, um, the guy that's kind of um, put together this show, he's like, oh yeah, by the way, G said he wants to chat to you after the show, right, right, right. and I, I me, mean, I'm gassed in it, because, do you know what I mean? You, you, you're one of the people that I uphold highly in terms of not just like, what you are able to do with your poetry, but what you've been able to do full stop, the fact that you went to Cambridge, the fact that you're doing a poetry, the fact that you're doing things with the Brit Awards and right, right, right. and, and mm-hmm. these are things that I aspire to do myself as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, man, I remember we, we obviously, I don't know how much you remember that day we, we had our conversation mm-hmm. and then you asked me, um, you asked me what, like, where do I want to take it? And I don't know if it was just my young naivety at the time. I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be bigger than you, cuz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that, I was like, oh, like, I'm trying to be bigger than you, cuz. Straight like, yeah, like I was what, 19 at the time, innit? I said it straight. I was like, this is heart, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just threw it out there. Mm. And then moving onwards from uni, like I think from my second, third year onwards, I was like, yeah, like I'm not really trying to be behind no corporate desk. This is what I want to do. I want to be able to shake tables with this. I want to be able to experiment and try new things. I want to be able to fuse it with music. I want to be able to tell stories mm-hmm. in ways which are more than just poetry. So I just went at it. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and similar to you, uni was... Okay, maybe not what it was at the back of my mind, but it was almost, I knew what I wanted and, and you yeah. knew it was just something I had to get through, yeah. do you know what I mean? So I got through and I guess that energy that I had coming off the back of uni is kind of what's allowed me to do the things that I'm doing today, that's yeah. allowed me to work with New Look on, 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 on advertising campaigns, it's allowed me to do a TED talk, do you know what I mean? Just because I yeah. said to myself, put energy out, like, this is me, this is Come what on. I want to do, do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, man, I do see a lot of similarities in terms of, like, how you've come at things and how I've come at things and you said um, one thing that really stuck out obviously with me as well like you said telling stories and um, one of your more recent projects is literally you just doing that in the sickest way possible Can you tell us about have you heard George's podcast yeah have you heard George's podcast is it's a podcast but it's more like an audio series mm. um, it's online right now so far there are, I've released four episodes but the fourth one is called 3.5 so if you go online right now and you're looking for episode four, in fact, by the time you watch this, episode four will be up. Mm. But um, in that, I'm trying to walk through various things. So obviously I'm trying to tell the audience as much about myself and my process. Cause I'm quite a complicated person. And the, the format that I've used previously has either been straight poems, like four minutes of me just flowing, or it's been sung. Yeah. But I'm... I need a bit more. I need a bit more space to be able to tell people to really complete an idea. Cause I was doing poems when I was, you know, in my early twenties, and I was doing songs when I was in my teens. So I, I love those things so much. I want to marry them and grow them. So it eventually became this podcast. And the podcast, each episode is kind of like a mini EP. It's like an EP actually. I'm gonna some people's EPs. Word. 
<laughs> so, and um, it's musical. It's got um, it's yeah, it's lyrical. But at the same time, it's, it, I'm trying to tell the most important stories that I can. Because my mentality when I record is. I could die today. And you know where that mentality comes from. Yeah, what? Guys die too young all the time around us. Mm. So, if I think maybe if I was 14, 15, I thought like that. Okay, if I, if I die today, X, Y, and Z, if, if, if I die today, you know what I'm saying, this is what I want. So whenever I record, I always think to myself, let me make sure that if this is the last thing I say, people can get as much out of it as possible. And that's how my podcast is patterned. Yeah. I think, all right, this was my last statement of the of the whole time that I was alive and each episode takes on education politics police community relations food journalism all of that all the poverty like you know you understand and for me I'm trying to I'm I'm kind of trying to promote the study of sociology Mm -hmm. sociology was what gave me the language to articulate all of these things obviously we know what we go through but when I started studying sociology, that's when I felt empowered with the, 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 even in my brain, there's just frameworks that I can access now. I can lift that and say, oh yeah, that's, remember the game theory, mm. or consider how the broken glass theory might play out in this scenario. And just having that language allows me to just, firstly, not take things so personally. When I was in Cambridge, that's the first time I really sat down and looked back at the ends from a distance. Mm. And some of my experiences, I was able to let certain things go. But you know how it is where we grow up. When things go wrong, there's no insurance. There's no compensation. Not everyone, the channels that are supposed to be there for us aren't there for us. So a lot of us grow up with this compound trauma that eventually evolves into bitterness. Do you understand? So by the time certain men come out of jail, they like, you hate parts of yourself. You hate parts, I hated parts of the ends, but the ends is a part of myself. Do you get me? So I had to go on that journey and I had to let certain things go and accept that this isn't personal, this is bigger than me. Mm. Like if I Mm -hmm. I die today, guarantee this thing's gonna be continuing. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? So when I I started seeing it like that, that's when I felt like I wish everyone had, had an education in this. Like, instead of us just going through life Mm -hmm. and running into the same problems that sometimes our parents did, our elders did, instead of just being confronted by that, what if we studied it from young, if if Mm -hmm. it was all in our music? Every time, because you know, a lot goes on when you're zoned into music. You're there receiving messages, broadcasts, vibrations, energies, Mm -hmm. and pretty much the same thing over and over again. We're frustrated mm. or we're escaping. Do you get me? Mm-hmm. We're getting high. We're, 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 we're going out, we're linking girls. And we're doing that because of the frustration. But how much of what we say in our art alleviates the problem? Like there's a therapy in, in letting it go. Don't get yeah, twisted. Absolutely. But how much of it shares information that can leave the listener in a different place? That was the question that inspired my podcast. Okay. And do you feel like that's direction or, or, or kind of do you feel like artists have a responsibility to come at things like that yeah. or do you feel like it, people should just make what they like or do you feel like there's there's mm. like a, a responsibility that we have to tell these stories and help each other understand because I feel like you're completely right by saying um, in terms of what music does by listening to music you absorb these energies you absorb this information and, and there's, there's power in music do you know what I mean? Yeah, man. There's power in lyrics, there's power in even the mixing. Do you know what I mean? So do you feel like as as artists, we have a responsibility to mm-hmm. tell these stories, especially people on a certain platform? I think we have a responsibility, but what happens is people get intimidated when you say that mm. because they think you're talking about morals. Mm-hmm. Like I'm saying, you must be a role model. Mm-hmm. You must be a good person. You yeah, must yeah, present yeah. yourself perfect. Not like that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you got a responsibility to be real. Wherever you're at, because mm. if you're addicted to friggin' eating glass, just put that on a tune. Mm. Because you don't know how many other people are addicted to it. You don't know how many it. people you're helping by doing that. <laughs> yeah, you some people might be out here really eating much of glass. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you are real when you record, then you contribute to the pool of knowledge that we have. Mm. So by the time Brexit comes along, by the time the Ministry of Justice makes changes to legal aid that affect our people disproportionately. By the time 
changes are made to the education system that affect our people mm. disproportionately. We have all the information there, and we just dip into the pool and say, hold on, this remember when Mana said this? Well, this is the study that supports that, and that's not fair to you. Because we need that because, just take this morning, when I was on the way here, I was listening to a certain podcast that I get from my political updates, mm. real parliamentary politics. Yeah, yeah. And for me, it's like, sometimes I don't want to hear people that don't sound like me, brother. Yeah, yeah. No. Like, it's an no. effort. Like, like I want to hear a voice. Like, that's why the Big Nasty show is so monumental for us. That's why yeah, platforms see. like what you lot are doing, like Mixtape Madness, Link Up, and all of these things are monumental for us because it's like, that accent's familiar. Do you get me? I know them, man. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, like yeah, yeah. Do you get Mighty. me? That's, 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 that's Mighty. Mighty. Yeah. Do you get, I can relax. I ain't got a, my, mate, my brain ain't doing styles. Yeah, like I'm going over time. Yeah. Do you get me? Like, okay, what are you saying? Like, let me decode this mm-hmm. language. Let me, like, it's cool. For me, I'm built like that. Like, I've, I, I spent time in education. Mm-hmm. Like, I was in the field in that sense. So I'm used to training myself to listen to deep academic speak. Sometimes I'm not in the mood though. And what mm. happens when I'm not in the mood? What if I'm in a phase where I'm not in the mood? Mm. I've missed out on four months of news. So what the rest of the country is talking about, I'm not talking about that. And guess what? What we were going through, the rest of the country don't know because we don't talk to each other. We don't have that common language. So by the time I'm coming on TV and I'm saying, uh, I'm, for example, like what's, what's been on my mind is that um, this Saturday, August 4th, mm. Anniversary of Mark Duggan. Mm. That's just been looming over me like, like a cloud for, for about a month. But you know, it's just gonna come and go. Yeah, but even, but like, but f- f- so this is what happens in my head. Before I think about how everyone else is gonna re- react, yeah, I try and organize my thoughts. I think, all right, what can we say? Like, what can we learn? How can we move forward? Given the process that we've been going through since that happened, mm. and I'm just frustrated because I know that. It's one of two things. Either I'm going to talk to the hood and we're all going to feel the same things, the indignation, the outrage, the frustration, the voicelessness. Mm. Or I'm going to talk to everyone outside of the hood and they're not going to understand. Some people are going to make an effort to understand. But it weren't their son, it weren't their brother, it weren't their brethren, it weren't their neighbour, it weren't their op, if we even want to Mm. take it there. Mm. It weren't their political, like... The the things that we go through don't really affect you a lot like that. Yeah, not at all. Do you get what I'm saying? So... It's on us to really, to really figure out how we feel about these things. And if we don't have that voice in the mainstream, and if we're not part of the bigger conversation, then we're routinely gonna miss out on opportunities to defend ourselves mm. on a on a on a higher level, on a on a spiritual level, really and truly. Yeah, because of a lot of the forces that can collude against us end up affecting our mental health. Emotional stability, the ability to provide and stay around our family, our peoples, our decisions eat away at us. How much money are, like how many fathers in the community are sitting down right now? Like what's that gonna do to the next? And then the, the, the musicians that are articulating this, if they're vilified and scapegoated as proponents or causes of this issue, then where does that leave the next generation? It gets me mad, do you get me? Yeah, what? So something has to give and for me it's like it involves going to the other side and having conversations, training myself in spaces that I'm not familiar with, but at the same time in ensuring that I'm updating my audience in that training that I'm receiving. If I go on question time, if I do a poem for the Royal Wedding, if I have a run-in with the feds, I have to make it all public and I go update my people what it means, mm. what, it, what you can learn from it as opposed to us just revisiting the same emotions.